Yes, this is like the third Toji video I've made over the last few months, so at this point, I guess you consider me a Toji stand for future reference, but yeah, cue the thematic intro. Toji Fushiguro, Jujutsu Kaisen's very own sorcerer killer, one of the deadliest characters in the verse, and someone whose physical prowess and combat skills strikes fear into some of the strongest sorcerers in the series. I mean, Gojo himself still has PTSD flashbacks on the daily from his only encounter with him, much less the entire Zenin clan knowing they only exist because Toji didn't even care to get his get back. Yeah, he's him. But how would a man like Toji fare in the one place in the verse where his fight and win or die trying in the calling games? A battle royale set up by the mastermind Kenjaku, which contains some of the strongest fighters in the history of the verse. In this video, I'll cover the hype train of a scenario in which Toji enters the calling games with a bounty on its players and a kill order for anyone that crosses his path. Anyway, before we get into the video, comment down below your thoughts on some of the insane matchups Toji would face. Subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed. We hit 2,000 subscribers off the back of my last Toji video. Not only did he break the fate of the Jujutsu world, but broke some ceilings for me too. But without further ado, into the generational rampage. So usually we would start this section of the video off by talking about the feats of the respective combatants. But seeing as this is kind of a Toji vs everyone video, we're gonna go ahead and only bring up feats in relation to the Pacific fight scenario. But something I will do is go ahead and decide which version of Toji I'll be talking about in this video. Because technically, there were actually two different versions of Toji seen throughout the series. Toji Fushiguro and Toji Zenin. With Toji Fushiguro being the version we saw in the hidden inventory or the Gojo past arc, where he gave a pre-awakened team Gojo enough trauma for a lifetime, as well as embarrassing a teen ghetto. But yeah, this Toji Fushiguro is much older than the version we see later in the series, and not at his prime when it comes to his physical prowess and overall combat ability as we see when he clearly states he was rusty after his first fight with Gojo. Yeah, he did that beat down while rusty. But he does have the combat and assassination experience that comes with age, as well as his vast arsenal of cursed tools which includes guns for some reason. Now for Toji Zenin, that's the version of him we later see in the Shibuya Instant Arc, in which Granny Ogami, a cursed user, uses her curse technique to reincarnate Toji. And we get a statement from Gege from around the time the chapter dropped, saying the reincarnation requires the name of the person when they were at their strongest or prime. And she specifically uses last name Zenin from before he left the Zenin clan when invoking the incarnation. This version of Toji is much more younger and stronger, but also due to the fact the body isn't his, he operates on instinct alone which tends to give him a more barbaric fighting style that completely disregards tactics, and he's only equipped with the playful cloud. How Bell has different versions of himself and not one of them involved him being a dad is beyond me, that dude is never beating the dead of the allegations. So in order to maximize the amount of fun to be had with this video, we're gonna go ahead and combine these two versions of Toji to make one epic killing machine. Equipped with both the monstrous physical abilities of his prime and the vast arsenal of weapons that comes with his experience. But with all that out of the way, into the first matchups. But what actually ended up taking me a while to decide the first colony Toji would take on, considering just like Maki, he could freely enter any colony he would want, as the barriers to the various colonies recognizes him as an inanimate object. But due to this, he wouldn't have access to Kogane, the NPC guide of the calling games, and wouldn't know anything about the opponents or the points they have in each colony, something that players could now do due to a rule added by Kashimo. So in any fight scenario, he would be going in blind with absolutely no prep time, something he actually had in his first fight with Gojo. And to be in line with the actual plot of the manga, I decided to have Toji start off his sorcerer hunt in the Tokyo 1 colony. Now, as I alluded to earlier, because Toji isn't formally recognized as a player in the coin games, he would simply be able to enter the colony as he wished, and would skip the whole getting jumped by a bunch of C-list sorcerers like Hani Rahaba. Instead, he would probably come in contact with Remy, an associate of Reggie Star, whose job was to lure in, or in some cases, seduce players that were stronger than her, which typically included everyone, over to Reggie, the reincarnated sorcerer, so he could then decide, depending on how strong the player is and how they react, to either convince him to join his group or straight up jump them. And even though Toji has shown to be very lax and carefree in most situations, such as the care of his children, he's definitely a man who never drops his guard despite his tendency to smile in pretty high tense situations and wouldn't fall prey to any tricks someone like Remy would try. We see what would probably happen in a scenario like this, and the anime only scene I'm so glad Mappa added of when Toji side eyed the crap out of that guy who bumped into him in the store. So yeah, Toji probably just kills her with that Glock 9 just like he did Rico, which is kind of funny because Remy kind of looks like the more adult version of Rico, but not before gaining access to Kogane, and with that the name of every player in their points across the four colonies. Sensing Remy's cursed energy drop due to a death, Reggie and his group of players decides to confront Toji with the purpose of recruiting him rather than avenge their fallen ally. But like father like son, Toji decides to not ally with Reggie's group due to Reggie's not offering Toji enough of that bread and would rather take them out in one go and save the trouble. 
Iri and Chizuru, two of Reggie's goons, would rush out for the ambush just for Toji with his heavily restricted abs to tank their attacks and slice them to shreds, leaving Toji to face the most expensive man in Jujutsu society. Yeah, so Toji vs Reggie, and like many of Toji's fights, would be a pretty one-sided fight. I mean, he would do Reggie worse than we saw Megumi do. Toji far outclasses Reggie in every category. Matter of fact, take away cursed energy and heavily restricted for a second. Toji's still boxing that dude up. I mean, the size difference should be illegal. And literally every man-made item on Earth Reggie could summon using his cursed technique would be useless, from a machine gun to a tank. All of it would just be rabble to the ultimate fighter machine in Toji. I mean, Toji would probably be the one to bring out a pistol just to troll Reggie. The only hope for Reggie I could see, and trust me, this is a big stretch, but throughout Volume 8 of the manga, which featured Gojo vs Toji, we got little bits of information on Toji's character from Gege. And we learned that the Soul Splitter Katana, a curse tool used by Toji, against the likes of Gojo and Ghetto, cost 500 million yen, which implies Toji bought it from somewhere. So if Reggie managed to reproduce that receipt and somehow managed to summon his own Soul Splitter Katana, a sword that completely negates durability and cuts straight to the soul no matter what, it would be his only hope at harming Toji in the slightest. Lightest. But who am I kidding cause that's more of a search than Mahito has ever done and Reggie would have no hope of even hitting Toji before he gets blitzed and just kicked out the window. Moving on from Reggie's group, Toji decides to find and eliminate Hiromi and Garama, have noticing at the highest points in the colony which could only mean he was the strongest. But before he sets out on the biggest bounty of the colony, he is confronted by Fumihiko Tagaba, a modern sorcerer with an awakened curse technique of comedian. Anything he believes is funny will become reality. Yeah, not gonna lie, I'm gonna choose not to go down the rabbit hole of how messed up an interaction between these two would be, considering one is a troll and the other is an assassin troll. Or whether the inverted sphere of heaven that's supposed to nullify all curse techniques would work in a scenario against Comedian. So I'm just gonna chalk it up to both of them having a chuckle over Toji's dark humor, coupled with Takaba's corny jokes, maybe he throws in some deadbeat ones in there, but anyway, they go their separate ways. But on the track towards Figurama, Toji finally finds the hideout of the disgraced lawyer. But it's also there he finds Yuji Dori and Megumi Fushiguro, two players who have recently entered the colony, who have allied with Higurama to face the biggest threat in their midst, Toji, or to them, the man who's super buff with no curse energy. And yet, not one of them are gonna end up doing a thing. At this point in the manga, there's still a decent gap between Toji and Yuji when it comes to physical stats. Although this gap is very small when comparing what would happen if we compared other characters with Toji, because I'd like to think that Yuji is one of the closest when it comes to their physical stats, as you see off his dual fight with Maki against Sukuna. And with Megumi, Toji would just tear apart anything that would be summoned, even if Megumi managed to do that. We knew Toji had extensive knowledge of the big three clans of Jutsu society and their inherited techniques as showcased in the Gojo fight, but it's safe to assume he knows about the existence of Maharaga, the Shinigami trump card, and wouldn't risk Megumi bringing him out by just blitzing him. But if you are thinking about a scenario in which Toji and Maharaga square up, I did make a video about that a few months ago, so feel free to check that out. So yeah, their only chance of surviving is Megumi somehow remembering who Toji is and claiming Yuji is also one of Toji's long lost bastards, which Toji would probably end up believing. As we know, Toji was willing to commit blank in order to protect Megumi from himself and Shibuya. But for the sake of the video, we're gonna remove Megumi's Fushigiro plot armor here and assume he's on the chopping block as well. Before the case of Sukuna possibly using his secret binding vow to take control of Yuji's body and take on Toji, I believe that is highly unlikely. We know that Sukuna only has access to his memories and Yuji's or the vessel at the time, neither of which includes any information about Toji or his heavenly restriction. So there would be no reason for Sukuna to feel the urge to come out and protect his vessel before Yuji gets blitzed with the Soul Spirit Katana. But with the main character duo out of the way, Toji vs Higurama is free to begin his court proceedings. Higurama seeing Toji is one bad dude, I mean he just watched him commit the murder of two minors just now, skips the depressing monologue and casts his domain expansion deadly sentencing right away, and Toji is then charged with multiple counts of child support evasion and something having to do with gambling as well as just being too cool. Wait, I almost forgot to mention, also the attempt in an actually complete murder of like 3 kids and an adult around like 11 years ago. In response to these allegations, Judge Man, the Shikigami of the Domain, would strip Toji of his cursed energy, and just because of how bad the deadly allegations were, immediately grant Higurama the Executioner's Sword, a weapon that would kill anyone with one hit. It wouldn't make much of a difference considering Toji never had cursed energy to begin with, and would be able to blitz Higurama fairly easily just off his raw physical ability. Especially when considering Higurama got clapped up by a cursed energy less Yuji, who is leagues behind Toji in physical prowess. Now I do have a bit of headcanon with this scenario as I believe deadly sentencing would actually remove Toji's heavenly 
restriction that he was born with if he ever was put in this situation. Considering his restriction to him is just like what cursed energy is to Jujutsu sorcerers. It is the sole reason he is able to be such the physical monster he is. So in the hopefully not far off headcanon scenario, Toji would definitely be judge and sentence. But sticking to the canon, Toji would reign supreme as the judge, jury, and executioner of Tokyo Colony 1. Next up on Toji's kill list would be the fighters of the Sendai colony, such as Yuda Kotsu, Mira for some unknown reason, and a four-way deadlock of some of the most powerful and vicious sorcerers in the culling games in Ryu, Yuro, Dhruv, and Kuroshi. Which from what we've seen would be the colony that most exemplifies the Bio Royale environment, of attacks from all angles and only the strongest which managed to rise above all challengers would be the sole survivor. A type of environment we've yet to ever see Toji in, and unfortunately we won't be delving into in this video. And that's due to the specific reason of Toji not having any cursed energies for others to sense or to pick up on, and would be untraceable as he moves around to attack the sources of the colonies. So he kinda just ends up avoiding the whole getting jump part that Yuta had to go through after his first fight. But to be blunt here, and this is coming from a Toji stand, there was no way he survives a 5v1 jumping in which all of his opponents possess special great levels of power, so his best shots allowed him to whittle each other down through various fights and take on the winner, which is definitely something he would do. But for the sake of the video and my stress levels, we're rather going to be exploring the scenario of Toji attempting to assassinate each of the colony's fighters one by one. I also added move to Sendai Colony instead of Colony 2, which would have been in line with the manga, because Colony 2 contains Kashimo, who has the most points in the entire Colony games and thus has gained the title of the strongest challenger. Toji being the tactical man he is would opt to ramp up the Kashimo by taking out individuals who while are not as weak as the Reggie Rabble he just took out, but are still far below in points in relation to Kashimo, hence the Sendai colony, which was also stated to be the most brutal when it came to fighting out of the four colonies. Starting off with Dhruv, and I hope I'm saying that right, a reincarnated sorcerer from the past brought back by Kenjaku, and a lesser known fighter out of the 4-way deadlock. His only fight in the series was done off screen and served to mark the arrival of Yuta Kotsu right into the middle of the standoff. And we do know Yuta killed him fairly easily as he wasn't shown to use Rika or any copy techniques or cursed tools and appeared to be in his base. But it's also through Yuta copying Doof's cursed technique and using it later in the series of fights, we learn that he controls two types of Shikigami, one being a giant beast that devoured anything in its sight, which allowed Doof to gain the most points out of the deadlock, and another Shikigami formed from his hair which was said to make a domain for Doof based on his trajectory that he could then use to harm his opponents. Now, Yuta really only used his technique as a distraction against Yuro during their big 1v2v1 and it didn't really have much of an effect on her. If Toji were to be taxed with killing this sorcerer from the past, it would probably go fairly easy. Toji would just sneak up on the old hag, Doof might use the Shikigami to form a domain made to harm Toji, who just nullifies it using his inverted spear of heaven. And seeing as Doof has no free store test his physical ability and frankly looks like he's not doing much in close combat, Toji proceeds to give him the ghetto treatment. Bro has to have something against Shikigami users, maybe from the 10 shadows in the Genin clan, to do ghetto that bad. The next of the fighters to meet Toji's blade would have to be Kuroshi, but for the sake of the video, my lack of ability to say his name correctly on a consistent basis will be called Kuro. A specially great cockroach cursed spirit who was released by Kenjaku through the use of Gevo's curse manipulation, and another member of the forward deadlock. Now surprisingly out of all the fighters Toji has faced so far, Kuro might actually serve the most trouble for the assassin. Seeing as Kuro is a cursed spirit, Toji would need to exercise this special great using cursed energy something he obviously doesn't have. But he tends to make up for that by using one of the many cursed tools in his possession, but in this case, all he would need is the inverted Spear of Heaven with the Chain of a Thousand Miles combo he used against Gojo during their second go around. As Kuro's Cockroach Storm and Hatching abilities make it an opponent field in all ranges of battle. If he gets close enough, he'll use his Fast String Life Sword, which hasn't been disaffected in centuries, to shoot cursed eggs that would hatch into your body and spread, until you eventually have to either cut off the body part or purge it with positive energy. And if Kuro opts to keep its distance, it could just send a swarm of cursed energy reinforced cockroaches to deal with his opponents. In this situation, Toji's best bet is to have the chain and spear act as both a barrier and an attack to anything Kuro throws at him. As in swinging that chain like a madman, except this time actually hitting your opponent and not turning into an Apple logo. Cause that was tough. Now the spear is stated to be coated with a foreign cursed energy that causes the stoppage of all cursed techniques it comes in contact with. So after a few swings of that chain spear combo and a whole lot of disgusted looks from Toji, Kuro would be rid out his swarm and forced to face Toji in close quarters combat, sword to sword. Except Toji's sword has actually been cleaned in the past few years because Kuro, you're just downright disgusting. 
But when it comes to Kuro and his physical capabilities, we clearly see he was far below the level of a base Yuta who was smacking it around barehanded. The only feat of note we could use is when Kuro survived a blast from Ryu, another special grade level 5 in the colony and someone who was trading blows with Yuta and Rika by himself. But durability wouldn't really matter when faced with the souls of the katana that negates toughness and cuts straight to the bone. With the only person we can use to scale Kuro's strength being Yuta, I'm going to opt to avoid that Toji vs Yuta argument until, until later in the video and just assume someone like Toji who was capable of reaching hypersonic feeds way faster than the fastest sorcerer alive behind Gojo and Naruto Zenin, who was also shown to be faster than Jogo, the fastest specially grade disaster cursed spirit, barring a true from Hito. Overall, Toji should be leagues above in speed than the likes of Kuro. And when Toji is faster than you and has the souls for the katana, it's practically wraps. Ghetto can tell you that better than anyone. But yeah, Toji exterminates Kuro and vows to find a cursed bug spray can somewhere on the black market for next time. Sensing the death of both Kuro and Drew, the more grow text and troublesome half of the deadlock, both Ryu and Yuro check Kogane to learn of the new challenger in their colony. But because Toji isn't registered, they learn nothing, and are first to confront the invisible man before he comes to pick them off one by one. Tracking the traces of the cursed energy leaking from the inverted spear of heaven, Ryu and Yuro, who are both accustomed to taking the high ground, begin to rain down attacks on their new opponent, putting Toji in a 2v1 scenario. And not just any 2v1 scenario because we've seen them in that before, but one where none of his cursed tools we have seen in the series would prove effective. Takako Yuo are a powerful incarnated sorcerer from the past who excels in close range combat due to her sky manipulation technique allowing her to redirect attacks and bypass her ability. And with Street Thor clashed with Yuta, Rika, Ryu, and Kuro, she was able to not only full on block an attack from Yuta, who had access to Rika's power at that time, but she was able to withstand a full barrage of attacks from Rika and Yuta at the same time. I mean, they want her to catch all those hands. With them making up two special grades in top 10 characters in the verse, and Yuo was still able to continue on fighting and even casting a domain which is an insane durability feat. And in Ryu's case, he excels in both long range combat, with his head cannon technique granting him the highest cursed energy output in the entire culling games. To the degree, he was even able to simply outright overpower the combined might of Yuta and Rika in a one on one clash of cursed energy blast. And he is just as strong in the close range, putting out enough power in his strikes to knock away a base Yuta and go toe to toe with a completely manifested Rika. So now back to the present scenario where you have these two powerful opponents in Ryu and Yuro joining forces and jumping Toji. Yeah, he's pretty much screwed. Because even if Toji manages to nullify sky manipulation with the inverted spear of heaven, Yuro is still clearly strong enough to do damage to the Fushiguro with her strikes. And all while taking attacks from Ryu from afar, making a deadly combo of both short and long range out of two unlikely allies. Toji is in a situation where he's backed into a corner, where he's simply overwhelmed and frankly outmatched in power as he stands in front of two of the most powerful sorcerers in the history of the verse. Yeah, Ryu and Yuo are top 10 strongest caliber characters in my book, I might have them tied at 9 or 10, and just want to take this opportunity to put some respect on these two sorcerers' strengths in their names because I don't know if that was a hard take or not. Toji will be forced to rely on his most deadly and notable attribute in battle, his speed. Because like I've always said and established, if Toji is faster than you, you have lost. Due to his soul split katana completely ignoring his opponent's defense, if Toji has the means of reaching you, yeah, just give up. And I'm obviously excluding Gojo with the Limitless, but even then, we saw how that went. But seeing as Ryu and Yuro only have one swing of battle which was against Yuta, besides Ryu getting sliced up like bread by Sakuna, and I would have to scale Toji's speed to theirs based on that only showing, which would unfortunately, regrettably, and sadly mean I'll have to get into Toji versus Yuta, easily one of the most contentious debates in the Jujutsu Kaisen fandom. Although as Yuta is technically a fighter in the Sendai colony which Toji is currently in, it was bound to happen eventually in this video. Now I've always held the opinion that Yuta is simply stronger, or rather I say more powerful than Toji. Keyword, powerful, as an attack power powerful. Especially when considering all the statements like the one we got from Maki herself in one of the more recent chapters, placing Yuta as more important than herself in a battle scenario with Sukuna. Or Kenjaku's heavy hitter statement regarding Yuta, Maki, and Akari doing the exact same thing with again, a Maki equal to Toji. And also just the level of attack power we know a full power Yuta and Rika could possibly summon. Which we know according to Kenjaku in the standard of being special grade, it's enough to bring down a small country, which is a huge step up from anything Toji has shown, as well as his ability to copy and then keep cursed techniques and cast domain expansions. But I've also always maintained that even with all that, if Toji and Yuta ever engage in a fight, I'm betting it all on Toji, someone who's used to standing up to some of the strongest around. 
From his cross tool Saka take Yuta and Orika out in one swing, while also being capable of negating the brunt of his cursed energy attacks with the inverted spear of heaven. To his body eradicated of all cursed energy, making Yuta's domain expansion and his guarantee hit useless. Coupled with the overall experience Toji has on Yuta, overall in a one on one matchup, Toji simply has the hacks to negate Yuta's biggest weapons in his arsenal, the experience to match Yuta's combat IQ, and not a care in the world for Yuta and Rika's teenage love. Although I also think we would need to see one more Yuta showing to definitively scale him, I will say any sort of matchup between the two would all come down to physical stats, more specifically and how I alluded to earlier, in speed. Now initially I have prepared a whole segment of the video where I compared the speed feats of Toji and Yuta, with the senses being Toji has simply shown more than Yuta who hasn't really put up anything scalable, cause apparently bro was always not trying in any of his fights. But I decided to scrap that because I wanted to discuss a much simpler but blatantly controversial way to argue Toji being over Yuta in speed. Yeah, I'm quite literally taking the much harder route here. But seeing as the most popular video on my channel is one on Toji, and some of my takes and analysts using it came under some fire, I'm going to take this chance to rehash one of those controversial takes which concerns the events of chapter 215, where a newly awakened Maki teamed up with Yuji to take on a 15 finger Sukuna who had just claimed his new vessel in Megumi, and it was because of the events of this chapter I made the claim that Toji, through Maki, was equal to a 15 finger Sukuna in physical stats, and now I'll explain exactly how and why that is with no room for debate. Now through this exchange, Maki who had been recently confirmed to be an equal fighter to Toji was able to engage Sukuna in hand to hand combat, and while she was never able to overpower him, Sukuna was also unable to actually damage her as well. And trust me, he full on socked her in this chapter, like on some these hands are ready to eat for everyone type stuff and even though it did nothing, he was definitely trying to put her in the ground. But it soon became clear to the two of them that the other was somebody who could match their intensity and overall combat ability, and thus they were relative in physical stats. But then comes the dilemma, because during the exchange, Sukuna mentioned that his cursed energy output was lowered when he attacked Maki or Yuji due to Megumi's soul interfering, with the officials not making it clear if he was talking about his cursed technique or his general output of power. Now usually when it comes to better adhering to the actual wording of the chapter's dialogue, fan translations typically do a better job than the officials. And in this specific matter, there are several fan translations that state Sukuna is referring to his output in regard to his curse technique of slashes and not his actual general output which fuels his physical ability. A translation that aligns with my take and also aligns with the actual fight itself. As he actually states in the previous chapter in both the officials and the fan translations, his physical movement was fine, which clearly matches up with the context of the fight and Sukuna's actions. Because when Sukuna first attacked Yuji, he sent him flying through multiple buildings, similar to what he did to Jogo and Shibuya when he was at the same level of power, and he made no mention of being nerfed. He actually went on to continue to battle Yuji with straight hands, and he still made no mention to being nerfed until he used his curse technique against Yuji. We see another example of this in the next chapter, as right after making the curse energy statement and how it lowers against Megumi's allies, he proceeds to use his curse technique to attack the floor, which had normal effect and also no mention of a 10% nerf. It all points to Sukuna having 15 fingers worth of cursed energy in his physical ability, with the nerf only applying to his cursed technique and Maki being relative to that version of Sukuna. And this same Sukuna, after removing the Megumi nerf, absolutely blitzed Ryu in chapter 216 when they met. So yeah, you can go ahead and forget about Yuta for a second. Maki and by extension Toji is physically relative to the guy who cut Ryu into slices before he could react. Now back to the culling game scenario where Toji would outright go feral and do the same to Ryu and Yuro as Sakuna did, but with a whole lot more blood. Yuta who spent the duration of Toji's fights protecting the citizens we know he counters at one point in the Sentai colony, finally decides to face his dominating fighter with the full power of Rika by his side which then causes his cursed energy to swell up, drawing notice from Toji's senses. But before this highly contentious clash can occur, they are interrupted by the arrival of a giant cursed beard worm thingy that attacked Maki in chapter 191. Yeah, this ugly looking dude is none other than cursed Nayoa or Nayoa in his cursed spirit form here to face his idol in Toji. And if it wasn't already clear from that, I am not willing to fully debate you to vs Toji in this video, so we'll put a pin on that for now with a completely respectable cop out, Nayoa and his fraudulent dream of being an honored one. So yeah, Nayoa taking Toji by surprise, knocks him away from the area, and in the creepiest fanboy way, introduces himself as the son of the Zenin clan head in Naobito, and also as the boy who side-eyed into submission as a kid. So Toji vs Curse Nayoa, yeah we've already seen it. Just as an awakened Maki did, Toji finishes up these scraps of the Zenin clan and probably will get a chuckle out of seeing what Nayoa has become. 
Next, in perfect Toji fashion, pretending to forget he saw Yuta when he actually doesn't want to go through that much trouble, he moves on to the Sakurajima colony of Maki, Noritoshi, Daido, and Mio. Toji and Maki meet as they both encounter someone else completely rid of cursed energy to the degree they both are for the first time. Now, in character, I really doubt they would attempt to kill each other seeing as they share similar paths, but of course, different outcomes. But they will probably just have a duel to see which one's body has better broken free from cursed energy. And seeing as Maki hasn't gone through her second awakening due to Nayoa never meeting her, this replaces that and becomes the moment she realizes, yeah, there are levels to this. After a little broing or technically little girling Maki, she's then confronted by the reincarnated sorcerer duo in Mio and Naito, who are just both looking for a heck of a fight. Toji, after a pretty busy day, refuses to entertain them and just makes sliced bread at the two. And Noritoshi, seeing all of this, realizes this isn't the moment to go all hero and just plays dead, leaving Toji as the sole challenger left in the Sakurajima colony. But despite single-handedly conquering three Culling Gang colonies, he still has yet to face the colony which holds the player with the most points gained, as well as the setting of one of Jujutsu Kaisen's best fights. Toji, completely revved up from his previous scuffles, is now ready to take on Kashima of Tokyo Colony Number 2, a reincarnated sorcerer from 400 years ago who reigned as the strongest in his era and became the strongest fighter in the Culling Games, arguably outside of Yuta. And he has most definitely immersed himself in that battle royale lifestyle he went through in the past because he managed to rack up 40 kills in just a few days, and as we see throughout his epic hype train of a fight with Hikari, he did all this without even using his curse technique. And to make this scenario even more climatic, Hikari will also be present when Toji eventually confronts Kashimo. But now to plot the scenario out, Toji enters the colony looking for the number one fighter, and he instead encounters Panda and Reggie who had just begun fighting not too long ago. Confronted by this mysterious player which in my head canon is covered in blood from all the previous fighting, Reggie being the simpleton he is, bum rushes Toji attempting to cut him just to see one second into his future. What a bum curse technique. But I see that playing out exactly identical to when Ghetto brought that curse spirit against Toji who had the domain revolving around if it was pretty or not. Toji amuses Reggie for about a second, tanks his attacks and completely slices into shreds, or in Reggie's case, pages. Panda seeing this and like others in his class has done, likens Toji's physical prowess and ability to Maki but a more perfected version. Now I wholly believe Panda would run away after seeing the beatdown Toji gave Reggie, but he also simply wouldn't be able to run away from Toji because it's Toji. And he decides to go all out using his third core, Triceratops, like he did against Kashimo in the manga. But seeing as we have no feats of Panda in this form because he got one-shotted by Kashimo shortly after transforming, and he also has a soul split of Katana, so either way, he's putting Panda through some more trauma. Momo Nishiyima, a third year student from Kyoto High, was watching this fight from above as she's been helping coordinate the efforts of her fellow students, takes note of Toji's strength and flies over to where Hikari and Kashima are just beginning their fight and alerts them both of a man she thinks is stronger than Toto, someone I think would be a reasonable representative of a high level of power in her mind seeing as Toto was grade 1. Hikari then proposes to Kashimo to temporarily put their fight on hold to band together against Toji, which Kashimo obviously initially rejects as he would rather fight both of them by himself, but later accepts that Sakari promises to give Sukuna's location if they win, and that all leads up to Toji vs Sakari vs Kashimo. Now being honest here, a huge reason why it took me so long to make this video was because of the dilemma of Kashimo and his curse technique. Because as I was writing the script for this part of the video, the infamous chapter 236 spoilers of September 19th hit the internet and besides the absolute bomb of trauma we saw in the chapter, we also saw Kashimo enter the battle against Sakuna as his next challenger. With this news, I knew I had to wait to see his curse technique and if we got any feats that would better help me scale Kashimo in relation to Toji or other characters. But after seeing what I saw in chapter 238, well, um, yeah, us Kashimo fans should be glad we still have the Ikari fight to look back on because its fight with Sukuna was definitely a funeral for the living. Anyway, we're gonna go ahead and stick with the Kashimo from the Cullen games as his performance against Sukuna didn't really help with feature scaling. And we already know he would never use his curse technique on anyone other than the King of Curses, which include Toji. But back into the fight scenario. Straying away from all the other scenarios in this video where you mentioned freaks and explain their relativity to each other, you can't really do that with a curse technique less Kashimo who's only had one fight and was truly getting overwhelmed in speed and strength by a jackpot Akari near the end of that fight. 
So instead of being super analytical with feats like I was with the Sendai Con scenario, we're just gonna look at how their abilities and attacks in their arsenal match up. Now, Kashimo, when his technique is not active, decides to strictly fight in the close range, utilizing his immense strength and speed through his hand to hand combat skills. Coupled with his cursed energy trait of constant electricity, which allows him to deliver blows that his opponents wouldn't be able to block with cursed energy as they would still have to suffer damage from the shock. And after he lands a few hits on his opponents, he's able to manipulate his electricity trait to place a positive charge on them, which he would then use to discharge a powerful lightning strike towards them so fast it acts as a guaranteed hit without the need of a domain expansion. This combo of Kashimo is enough to take out 95% of the series, and again, this is not even accounting its actual curse technique. But luckily for Toji, he is in the 5% that actually rises above Kashimo's deadly stroke. Well, pause. First off, the curse energy trait which makes Kashimo's attacks unguardable and overall makes close combat with him so dangerous wouldn't have the same effect on Toji. As we learn in chapter 77 in which Yuki breaks down what makes Toji and his heavenly restrictions so rare, and she mentions that because of his body having zero curse energy and his senses being sharpened to the max, he was able to develop a resistance to curse spirits and thus curse energy. And we probably saw an example of this in his fight with Ghetto where he was able to take one of the cursed spirits attack without effect. And a more recent example in the rejaw done by Gege for the Angel vs Sakuna fight in the manga in which we can actually see Maki take an electricity attack from a super sized new who is under Sakuna. So Kashimo's cursed energy trait of electricity simply wouldn't work on Toji which also prevents him from placing a positive charge on Toji, thus eliminating the option of the lightning discharge, which if it landed would have probably done Toji in. Considering it's lightning and is many more times faster than the speed of sound, a range of speed Toji resides in. But without the use of his cursed energy trait, his lightning discharge, or his cursed technique, Kashimo was left with nothing that could harm Toji. And seeing as Kashimo resides strictly in the close range, he would eventually fall prey to the soul's Pudo Katana. Damn, that is one annoying hacks. But before Kashimo could get finished off, Hakari steps in and, well, Hakari would try to activate his domain to attain Jackpot, which would prove ineffective, as told you when he's the consent to be trapped in the domain due to being registered as an inanimate object. And without that consent, Hakari has no way to activate his domain and attain that Jackpot, as we have no sign he could just expand his domain without an opponent present. And a base Hakari just loses. It isn't a competition. Except when it comes to us more swagger, now that's a competition. But when it comes to a scenario like Jackpot Kari vs Toji, that's another video for another time. And just like that, Toji wins the culling games and whoever put him up to this now has a massive hole of debt cause you already know Toji's asking for that bonus. Yeah, this was definitely one of the most fun videos I've ever done and of course it was done with Toji, who I'm officially declaring my favorite character with this one. In a pretty long video so I'm going to go ahead and end it with if you enjoyed, make sure to subscribe to the channel, turn on post notifications, and most importantly comment down below how you think Toji or any other Shibuya era characters fare in the culling games and I honestly might make a series out of this. So yeah. Toji's biggest op isn't the Zenin clan, but child protective services. Have a nice day.